my lecture is entitled <coughs> Abstraction and Generosity on Intellectuality Today. Each simple line demands action from me in order that I shall apprehend it as what it is. This writes Wilhelm Worringer in his doctoral dissertation entitled Abstraction and Empathy, Abstraktion und Einfühlung, from 1906. For apprehending a simple line for what it is, he continues, I quote, I have to expand my inner vision till it embraces the whole line. I have inwardly to delimit what I have thus apprehended and extracted as an entity from its surrounding. End of quote. I want to suggest in the following that the apperceptive action of which Warringer speaks in this text expresses a keen awareness, avant la lettre, for the scientific developments in his own days towards the novel nature of quantities. I am aware that this sounds odd at first, to say the least, because eminently the book is about the aesthetic sense and style. It is about art, not science, about qualities, not quantities. But my claim lies motivated in the fact that Warringer was looking at these themes with the cunning eye of a mechanic who wanted more than defining clear notions to understand their inner workings together. <clears throat> with this gesture, Warringer is similar perhaps to Sigmund Freud, of whom it is widely discussed today, how much his analytical methods draw from thermodynamics, how much those methods abstain from making particular qualitative claims and instead proceed in quantitative manners by relating balances to one another. With Warringer, so the inkling I want to follow <coughs> in this paper, the novel nature of quantities was not that which came with thermodynamics, but that which came with quantum physics. What began to take shape in Warringer's time was that physics began to deal formally with quantities whose physical reference are charged nuclei, particles that are within a certain quantum physical bounds, balanceable, chargeable, measurable, and actual energetic in manifold manner. What was rumbling in these developments is how to address a certain force, a certain efficiency that is at work in ideation. And it is with regard to such material efficiency that I imagine Warringer began to think about abstraction. In terms of a material efficiency, it seemed possible to begin speaking about aesthetics and art as it had been custom with regard to the pre-Newtonian mechanics as well. In non-absolutist terms, the mechanic was an artist, even if she built things as practical as water mills, because the, me as <coughs> because the mechanic was she who knew how to relate opposites to each other, such that they are productive in their interplay. Different from the logician, the mechanic needs not exclude the middle, the impure third, even the most simple of machines combine movement with rest, activity with stasis. But the price she pays by being an artist is that the mechanic can never claim that she exhaustively knows the materials and forces she deals with. They remain mysterious, at least to a certain extent. My intuition by saying that I read in Warringer's text a keen awareness à la lettre for the scientific developments in his own days towards the novel nature of quantities, is that he follows just such an artistic curiosity that contents itself with building conceptual tools that affords art history to study styles objectively, non-hegemonically. The theme he treats is the relation between modernity, classicism and style. What was at stake was a notion of culture and humanness that was to be considered natural universal, but also intellectual. The problem was similar as that within philosophy at large. John Stuart Mill had written with regards to what he called concrete thinking in act, already in 1836, I quote, we cannot describe a fact without presupposing something more than this fact. 
For Mill, no inductive method can do without what he called a theory of naming that complements practices of observation. For Mill, this naming was the naming in verbal language. I want to dope Mill with Worringer. I want to look for a kind of naming that would do what Mill's theory does as well, namely complementing the movement towards generalization by inductive reasoning with a framework of corresponding customs, but not in terms of a social relativism. <clears throat> those corresponding customs can be addressed, I think, as those of a mechanics, as those of a mechanics learning to cope with the ideational force of an aesthetical sense. I imagine such naming not in terms of epistemology, as the conception of ideas, in definitions, in concepts, but in those of epistemic practices as the sculpting of ideas. I call it so because in sculpting it seems all we ever do is take some of the given material away, such as to expose a latent form, a latent shape or character that had been residing within the given material all along. But actually, such manifest subtraction requires an ideational and immaterial kind of adding to it first. A block of marble, a set of materials to be worked with, needs to be doped, projectively attributed, credited, as incorporating something more and something else, an, un, an indefinite muchness that comprehends more than what is immediately evident. I am interested... <laughs> I am interested in such a kind of naming that engages with identifying the relation between an object and its referent through an act of insubstantial giving. Such a name is a nominal word that means less than a proper noun and that at the same time is capable of also doing more than a proper noun. It is a naming that does not seek to be specific or general but that draws instead from the relation between the singular and the universal in like manner, perhaps, as personal names do this. Personal names single a someone out and afford addressing them and remembering them beyond their death. Different from proper nouns in verbal language, personal names need to be given. They do not naturally belong, even if they must always be linked up within genealogical lineages. Because they can only do what they do, single out the person, if they set a clock in motion that counts the time of this single being such that it can be referred to and also narrated, recounted, accounted, appreciated and criticized. Personal nouns I want to consider singularize something universal by dating it. To receive a personal name means in a certain way being treated as data. Here you are, welcome. Indefinitely, rather than being addressed properly, put in one's proper place, in terms of species, genera, kinds, or any other class to which an entity is believed to belong. Personal names cut into the cycles of becoming. They operate in a domestic kind of domain <coughs> that opens up and out of and within generational lineages, within an architectonic fabric of genealogies. The points they single out are points of confluence, points where different lines cross each other and mingle up with one another. What personal names do by this is attributing, without determining it, an age to whomever is the recipient of those names. It is along such lines of attributing or receiving a personal name, rather than a proper name, that I want to develop Waringer's theme of apperceptive action. In the polar and cyclical relation between abstraction and empathy, he proposes, there resides a dimension of indetermined consequentiality that Waringer himself does not really attend to. When he says, I quote, apprehending a simple line as what it is requires the inner vision, requires to expand the inner vision till it comprehends the whole line, Waringer remains somewhat inarticulate with regard to such wholeness. It is this dimension that I want to foreground by addressing it as a source for generosity and freedom and I want to think of it as a source that cannot be tapped without at the same time contributing to it. 
A source that is not a resource. Such a source can be tapped by referring to things pre-specifically in terms of data, by addressing them and by getting involved with them as abstract persona. Personal names in this sense are names that single out and rationalize, render finite, through dating, some of the intellectual power of the capital force that manifests in all things we can refer to articulately. Before looking at how we could imagine this, let's ask why we should bother in the first place. What motivates this play of speculative attributions that I am presenting here is on the one hand the fact that the novel nature of quantities, which I want to relate to Waringer's psychomotoric activity, has meanwhile transformed not only science at large, but also our modern forms of living to such an extent that in all possible domains, what we do is bound by datafication. The abstraction that, that exposes an object as an object today proceeds by dating an object. What dating does, before all else, is attributing an age to its object. This leads me to the second motive for this gamble of speculation. If objectivity is constituted today by attributing an age to a thing, we need to reconsider the temporality notion that is at stake between generations. Waringer's approach lends itself so well because he too was seeking to overcome a temporal order that goes linearly from primitive to advanced by resolving it into a directed but indefinite cyclicity between different poles. As he surely knew well, in the overlapping phase shiftings between generations, there is a kind of formation taking place that affects all sides and also all layers of the overlapping. A formation where not only the old, think classic, determines the new, the young, think modern, but where also the young acts upon and informs the old. None of the involved sides is entirely in charge of such authoritative identity. So conceived, in terms of generational cyclicity, recognizing something for what it is, is an action that has not only direction, and hence is rational, probable, um, with consequentiality, but this direction is qualified, as I want to suggest here, with more or less generosity. How can we imagine this? The rationality involved in abstraction as apperceptive activity is not one of equilibrium between two sides. If a line is given as a line, there are a thousand ways of embracing it as a whole line. There are a thousand ways of thinking one direction, the line to its perfection. One has to clarify how to think about a direction, about a beginning and an end, about linking up points, about localizing points, about planes and their ordination, about parallelity and intersection, and so on. Grasping something for what it is means to embrace, already in the case of a simple line, all of geometry. And this all, as we well know, always reproduces itself with greater power and maturity whenever attempts at its perfection or completion succeed temporarily. Hence, this direction is not only qualified with more or less generosity, but also with more or less maturity. My theme, abstraction and generosity, is concerned with how to engage actively with a domain that perhaps shapes our present contemporary time more than anything else, namely that of the given in terms of data, the domain of quantitative, technologically processable data, the domain of information whose background is noise. Interestingly, even so, Waringer introduces a mechanistic approach towards the genesis of the artwork, it is one that is in considerate distance to materialistic approaches, specifically that proposed by Semper's theory of style. Waringer regards the latter with greatest respect and recognition for its subtlety, imaginativeness and sophistication. But as a scientific theory, he discredits it for principal reason, I quote, as a point of support for hostility to progress and mental laziness." End of quote. Relating this in, to the above-mentioned passage about how geometry regenerates itself with ever greater maturity, the more abstract its basic notions are being considered, 
we can imagine more clearly what such mental laziness and such hostility to progress might have meant for Warringer. Today, we too are challenged not only with qualitative geometries, as was predominant for Warringer, but also with very abstract and hence in many fold manner qualifiable notions of quantities. I mean thereby the novel nature of quantities that is brought about by quantum physics, which I mentioned in the beginning, and which is constitutive for all our contemporary forms of technology that are based in electricity, code, that manifests in data and that triggers a comprehensive datafication of the whole world. The setup for this proposal here is to orientate the cyclical polar relation between abstraction and empathy, of which Waringer speaks, with two crossing axes, one of maturity and one of generosity. It renders the polar cyclicity into a generational cyclicity, a novel kind of meteora, a novel kind of what the ancients called, I quote Michel Serre here, the contingently calculable sum of all measurable du durations. They spoke of the wisdom of Meteora with regard to a mixed human condition in which earthly conditions, geographical, geological, practical, technical, co-condition a living climate together with cosmic, astronomical, astrological, theological conditions. My schema aims at proposing the conceptual means that might be capable for triggering what Rosie Braidotti called yesterday the forming of social imaginaries for our contemporary world. Social imaginaries that are capable of orientating what she called the growth of knowledge to power. What can such a proposal to relate apperceptive action to dealing with quantities through attributing proper personal names to them possibly hope to contribute. We need to be wary that such imaginaries don't acquire cultic forms. The preeminent candidate for such emerging cults can arguably be seen in what we need to call perhaps a certain idolatry of the quantitative. I am speaking of an idolatry here because it is foremostly not code but images of the nature of quantities that inform and drive rationalization coupled with social political ideations. Such images are, for example, a quantity as an entity in colloquial common sense reasoning, numbers as a linear continuum in analysis, numbers as a definite set of possibilities in statistical reasoning, or numbers as units in metrical reasoning. It is with regards to such images that we need an understanding of abstraction as apperceptive action today. My proposal is to regard these images as the forms of a digital kind of geometry, a geometry that is capable of comprehending what Michel Serre calls the contingently calculable sum of all measurable durations in our practices of datafication. What manifests in technology without a doubt is objective knowledge, knowledge that is sound, rigorous, precise, in that it is based on quantification and rationalization. But this objective knowledge can no longer claim to be neutral, in uninvested by ideas, will, intent. It is no coincidence that science at large is addressed, is addressed increasingly so as techno-science and no longer falls into hard natural science and its soft cultural complements, the humanities, jurisprudence, political science, also medicine. Technoscience demonstrate in unsettling manner that such a division between things natural and things artificial, cultural, appears to be exhausted, outdated. A notion of the social steps in and provides the paradigm for such technically constituted science. But science thereby turns into a practice dominated by industry and political agenda, while the epistemologies that follow a finite anal analytics is kept in what Michel Foucault called, in the order of things, the anthropological slumber. Nature as the domain of things that are born, where one can learn to comprehend things in terms of, the work, of how they work or don't, where such working cannot be reduced to questions of subjective will, threatens to fall out of our scope altogether. In antiquity, they called such enclosed imaginary hubris. All data is mediated by code, 
To put this figuratively, data is quantities that wear masks. Data is quantities that are mannered. It is in this sense that my proposal here is to address data through the attribution of personal names. Persona being the very word for masks and mannered action, both in drama as a literary form, but also in politics. Personal names, I argued, cut into the cycles of becoming. But their reference is not properly what philosophy calls being. For to be a person, this is to have a public identity. With regard to politics, this term, a, personal, a public persona, has been discredited lately, if not replaced almost altogether with that of an individual political subject who wants to be represented properly in all that pertains to public affairs. But is it not significant that we relate to public identity almost exclusively in the economical and to a large degree mythical and cultic terms of brands or stars? In politics, when we refer to the public identity of someone, we tend to mean someone who does not adequately represent whomever that person is meant to represent. Someone who is exposed as opportunistic, an empty character uttering empty words, a joker in the wielding of political power. Speaking of someone in politics as a public identity usually legitimates an exposure of sorts, meant to discredit that person and dismiss her from the public trust and office. Indeed, it does demand a great leap in thinking and a huge amount of risky credit to consider addressing data through the attribution of personal names. Because it means intercepting how the domain of the quantitative indexes something eternal and timeless. Quite different from a direct connection, personal names due to, due to their generational order in genealogical lineages are indicative to time always already divided into past, present and future. Antiquity knew several personifications of time. Kairos is the time of coincidence. Chronos, this is time countable in past, present, future. It is premised by Kairos. And it manifests in chronicles, in time that is being kept, in accounts and narratives. Another powerful personification is one of time as a whole, of unbounded time. It was called Aion. Interestingly so, this latter personification of time not only names the timeless, referring to immortality as that which is spared from cycles of generation and decay, it also names and attributes thereby an age to time itself. Whenever in history we speak of an era, we are referencing the personification of time as a whole, but we do so idiosyncratically. Idiosyncratically, because there are philosophical or theological aspects to history that concern such a framing of time. Ideas of progress, of crisis, of return, also those of salvation and prosperity, all need to come to terms with this. From the mechanics cunning point of view, what keeps troubling any theory of the accountability of time is the nature of mathematics, whose literal meaning is all that pertains to learning. Mathematics keeps confronting us with the fact that all that can be known from the point of view of mathematics must be considered finite, since it proceeds by rationalization. But at the same time, such mathematical finitude characterizes the infinite in ever new and ever more powerful manners. So considered, mathematics, like all learning, is a spiritual practice, even so it lets itself be falsified on positive grounds. Dante Alighieri, the early Renaissance poet, dealt with the implications regarding freedom, determinism and the strife for the good that are related to questions about the personification of time in his major work, La Commedia, which was later called by Boccaccio, the title for which it is well known today, today La Divina Commedia. The comedy as a dramatic genre, like the carnival, originates in harvest festivities. It always deals with a lot, a too much, with incommensurable magnitudes or heterogeneous scales. Henri Bergson, in his study on laughter, derived an entire mechanics of the comic as a mechanics that is comic because it works on conditions of abundance. He stressed the role 
of the comic, in tempering our reason, in providing outlets, valves for explosive tensions, Dante wrote his work in exile as a way to thematize the conflict between papacy and the Holy Roman Empire. It was one of the first books that was written in Italian vernacular and hence did not claim the authority in voice that always attributes to the Latin language. With that, <coughs> Dante seeked to circumvent confrontation. He claimed a third, immediate, a domestic domain between the two imperial authorities. In it, he introduced abstract persona, both political as well as dramatic, that also represented authority, respected ones, but domestic, not ultimate, like the poet Vergil, whom Dante made into the guide between the different afterworlds or beyonds which the comedy portrays. My proposal is to regard mathematics via the code that, via the code that articulates quantities. There are several images for quantities that claim to ground code and save it from the emptiness of a code's constitutive cipher. My proposal is to speak of the offices of the quantitative in the vernaculars of computational symbolic code. In such vernaculars that are yet to be acquired as literacies, like those in Dante's time were too, we can give personal names to data records. By this, I would like to think that we can call forth a soft and yet strong kind of social imaginaries, social imaginaries that are critical, that are capable to distance themselves from any kind of idolatry. What we need is social imaginaries that will correspond to the dating of objects and hence to the nature of time itself. For this reason, they can no longer be narratives, since every narrative inevitably speaks from the end of time of the text. Narrative as a literary form identifies with time, as does history with a capital H. In another and lesser known book, where Dante treats philosophy, he applies the same literary strategies. He wrote in vernacular, claiming a third domain that coexists with the great authorities in philosophy, and hence brings their teachings to common people. In this book, Dante picked up the genre of the symposium, which, as a form of philosophy, originates in how the domestic welcomes and domesticates the pursuit of knowledge. A symposium was a banquet, ein Gastmahl. The symposium treats of the ancient custom to reconvene around a table of gifts, a domestic altar, where artistic renditions were performed around the theme, love, in the case of Plato's well-known symposium, or puzzles, which those reconvening would pose to each other, or where those reconvening would engage in a sports of sorts, namely to find adequate comparisons for interesting and troubling words. In a significant way, a symposium was all about translating, in a sculptural kind of manner, what cannot properly be named, what cannot properly be identified, and which was considered, nevertheless, to be appreciated by paying shared recognition to it. Symposia are a format in which the innermost domestic exposes and opens up its secluded privacy to a polite sociality among guests, strangers, in short, among those with whom one is not like. A symposium often followed a contest. By its very intention, it is a domestic political form for schools of thinking. The symposium reconvenes those who do not share family relations, nor hierarchy. The customs and manners that are being valued, common among all the participants, are those of sophistication. In that, symposia continued the mythical legacy of architecture, whose early sculptures were known as mobile statues. Their beauty, their articulateness, was called Daedalus, because it involved the cunning and the ruse of the legendary first architect, who, after King Minos had cheated on Zeus, helped Minos' wife to seduce the beautiful bull, with which, by punishment of Zeus, she had fallen madly in love with. Daedalus then helped Minos himself to contain the consequences in the famous labyrinth in which the monstrous offspring, the Minotaurus, was to be caged. To value sophistication, this is different from values based on consensus or agreement with regard to truth. 
Dante picks up this history of the symposium and calls his book Convivio, Italian for living together, stressing thereby not commonality, but differences. Reconvening around the domestic table of gifts to negotiate conviviality in the domestic political form of the banquet, this is the form of a social imaginary that I would like to offer with my proposal. It invites us to consider addressing data through the attribution of personal names by attending to records and data sets <clears throat> as a kind of mobile statues, as architectonic statues, as the witty intellectual articulations that they so often are. As I proceed in my talk, I would like to ask you to bear this Dante-esque gesture in mind. Let's aim at welcoming, at the, whole, let's, at welcoming the whole world at our tables. After all, we are talking about the age of time itself, when the masked appearance of the quantitative in science that dates its objects is at stake. Everything speaks in terms of code and information. Let's consider thinking about public intellectual life around those domestic tabular orders where recorded data sets are placed and socialize with one another. Figuratively speaking, we need to ask who is a particular data record claiming to be? How does it claim its identity? What does it contribute to the symposium? What does it consume? And with what other data record is it in competition? Is it in love? And furthermore, who is the host at whose tables of gifts we find ourselves reconvening? And what is the character of the competitive cultivation in whose ban terms a banquet's constitutive appreciation of sophistication is to establish commonality, convivio, coexistence. Let's return then to how we started. There is a novel nature of quantities emerging and it is challenging our inherited notions of how <coughs> to reason about them. They are quantities as charged nuclei, atoms, but not really undividable, rather polytomic than atomic, because balanceable, measurable, and actual energetic in various manners and many ways. This novel nature of quantities is constitutive for what today is often called by the undoubtedly imprecise, but nonetheless elusive and evocative title, namely the generic. Generic is perhaps best pictured in the sense of a structural blueprint, a genetic code, like we address in those expropriated drugs, the so-called generica. But speaking of a genetic code, as if there were many instances of it, as a general class, as if we could <coughs> speak of a genetic code like we speak of an apple or a conference. This sounds odd, and this oddity does guide us, I think, in the right direction. Of such a thing entitled generic, just like of such another thing called genetic code, we cannot properly speak of as a thing at all. For what it refers to is not an entity, it is more something like thingness without individuation. But despite these difficulties in addressing this thingness we call generic, or likewise the genetic code for what they are, those terms are important words of greatest relevance today. At least of the genetic code, we can say that it is universal. Strictly speaking, if I understand this right, all things existent, animate or inanimate, share inscribed in the bodily memory of their amino acid substances traces of all that has ever existed. Everything bears traces of every other thing, of every star, of every galaxy that has ever existed, of every species that has ever lived. All is, strictly speaking, inscribed, remembered, embodied in the so-called genetic code. But this concern with material stocks of time is not singular to biology as a discipline. All our sciences relate today to their objects by dating them. The world itself is attributed a date. The planet on which we live is approximately four and a half billion years old. To date, this means attributing a birth, natality. The literal meaning of nature meant that which is born. Our science attributes a date and hence a nature even to the universe at large. Its age, so we are told, is approximately 15 billion years. These ideas, I have them from a book by Michel Serre, which is called L'Incandescent. It's a very, very remarkable book, which changes the way 
at least for me, of how to look at the world, which I very much recommend to reading. It will be translated next summer in English, I heard, and will be forthcoming from Bloomsbury Press. Given the diversity <coughs> of all there is, we need to bear witness to a heterogeneity of scales by which such dating proceeds. Let's ask then, <coughs> when considering that the reference for datafication in terms of such an understanding of natural time, of time in terms of its universal ageness, are we not being, to a certain degree at least, comical in the sense of pursuing the domestication of thought raised to power as discussed above? After all, the ageness of the universe is counted symbolically. Its records are literally being picked up from outer space of the world. By appreciating the comicality in all of this, the aim is not ridiculization. The aim is to draw attention, for now, to the domestic domain of knowledge here in this world in the manner of the sophists. The novel literacies that become available as techniques today are the quantum literacies of digital code. This is why I think this other notion, that of the generic, is of such tremendous importance today. It names the objectivity of a thing Result, it, it names that the objectivity of a thing results no longer from a cutting it out of a spatio-temporal occasion or situation, which is the classically inherited meaning of what to abstract means, but from sculpting it out of a growing stock of time's ageness. Like Warringer, when he when for apprehending his simple line for what it is, he has to expand his inner vision till it embraces the whole line, or like a sculpture, who has to add a lot before he can treat a given material purely by subtracting from it. Whoever is involved in datafication will come up with something that is strictly relative to what she had to offer, to attribute, to give to the situation whose age is thereby being stated. From the point of view of the generic, the objectivity of a thing results from attributing accountable time to it. The objectivity of our objects of science today results, in short, from recognizing a thing in its proper age. To be of age, as opposed to being of non-age, this is the decisive factor, not only in the political sense, as Kant has dealt with, but also with regards to the subjectivity of nature. I quote Aristotle, maturity is the summit of natural life. It has been constitutive for relating being to becoming within a scope of fulfillment or perfection that is, in an awkward way, generative. The scientist for Aristotle was the due master of nature in that, by means of her intellect, the scientist can help nature to prosper and, th and thrive, to perfect and fulfill itself. The scientist's pursuit of knowledge was a kind of pursuit of mastery that knows how not to exhaust nature, how to treat it well, etc. The entire metaphysics he proposed is aimed at a realism organized around such an understanding of knowledge with regard to nature. Realist stances with regard to nature have not been in great fashion during the past 10 or so decades. Hence, it is not simply an unmotivated coincidence if contemporary philosophy is obsessed with thinking a revolt of nature, with addressing a peculiar kind of agency to things, to objects, if talk about human nature as entering a new age proliferates today, and if political philosophy speaks of biopolitics or lately even of necropolitics or thanatopolitics. It is not simply a coincidence of fashions, but it cannot be easily sorted out either. Part of the reason why, I think, is that we lack an understanding of abstraction that constitutes these novel practices of datafication. There is a statement by Rem Kohlhaas that is as insightful as it is unsettling and that has been troubling architecture discourses since a few years now. The generic is merciless. He wrote in a text on contemporary cities. It is a text in which one barely recognizes any of the city's cherishable attributes. One can hardly recognize in it the city as a place for conviviality, for living together on largely free and self-responsible grounds. I considerately use largely here as an intensifying qualifier. The unsettling impact of this statement, that the generic be entirely merciless, lies, I want to suggest, 
precisely in a kind of moralization which COLAS advocates with regards to procedures of datafication. My intent with relating abstraction to generosity is one possible attempt to respond to it. As much as one might grieve about the arguably increasing banal reality of contemporary cities, the moralization of datafication exposed and acknowledged by Kohlhaas is in its own terms hard to be welcomed. That is because structure, genericness, these have been strong ideas in the past decades, ideas invested with a promise that regards how political subjects can relate to one another. Structure, genericness, they hold the promise of neutrality, where they used to be dominant. Those concepts promised to deliver us from the fact that every system needs to be rooted in a principle, a center, a capital, and similarly, every city needs a major, a governor. Thinking about cities in terms of structure and genericness held for nearly a century now, the promise that there can be a form of self-organized governance that rids itself entirely from any form of domination. Those two terms stand for a kind of facticity, an objective record of the real that promises to strip positive knowledge from all aspects irrational and expose things in a purely rational, hence indisputably accountable manner. The promise they provide, they promise to provide a common denominator for social justice based on good and common sense. What Kolas evokes with this moralization of these ideas is to bring in the registers of meaning once more, where apparently all that is left is sense. The generic city is the city stripped of identity, he tells us. It is the city to which meaning attributes only by negation in terms of, a subs of subtraction or me lessness, meaninglessness. The generic city is the city for which the overabundance of sense, of possible sense, is at the same time the very absence of sense. Overabundance means that possible correlations abound, that anything can relate to anything. But even in the quantifiable terms of meanings increasing lessness, meaning does not leave sense all to itself. There is still a complementary notion of order too. Sense, etymologically, means direction. And direction, ignorant of its meaning, goes at once in all directions undecidedly. With this we have indeed a good comprehension of the entropic order in which the generic manifests itself. Entropy is a state that could develop in a definite amount of possible directions and that is undecided as to which will be the next step of such a development. All options in an entropic state are equally likely to happen next. Entropy denotes an order that resides in the absence of order and that is nevertheless ill-conceived when thought about as the negative to a positive. But I am quite convinced that we, should also, that we would also be ill-guided when assuming that the entropy notion of order meant something like the imposing reality of nihilism, the belief that all values are baseless and that ultimately nothing can be known or communicated. Such an understanding forgets that every material order that can be called entropic in any scientific sense is complemented by a logical order, logiciel in the sense of software, where logics and logistics, formality and dispositions condition one another and provide together an order of vicarious placeholder positions, an order that delimits and rationalizes the definite amount of possibilities. My proposal is to begin asking who these abstract persona are that occupy the empty positions around the tabular orders, what are their customs and what are their table manners. What we need to think today is the relation between geometry, form and the quantum domain that constitutes the generic. This relation, I want to suggest, needs to be localized in order to be addressable. We can no longer be allies with time itself. Our social imaginaries need to ask where such localization is possible. It is with an interest in precisely this locus in quo that the papers of this first day are captured under the name amidst, between a lot and too much. My own paper attends to this locus from a point of view which I learned from Dante Alighieri, 
One of the thoughts that strikes me most when reading the Convivio, the banquet, is that he says, I quote, arrogance is to, is to demand justice from what cannot be willed. So I'm slowly concluding now. Is it not disproportionate to evoke such a grand scope with regard to Warringer's apperceptive activity? My decisive interest in it is with regard to what we can learn today from the ideas put forward there. By today, I mean the today in which there is a forgetting with regards to what it means to have a socialized system of education. There is a sense of frustration with regards to the abstract. Things sounding abstractly is commonly related to impracticality or in short term thinking to a principle non-usefulness. It manifests in an increasing anti-intellectualism, in opportunistic pragmatism, in novel forms of feudalism, populism, nationalism, and also fundamentalism. It often goes together with a disgust against cunning and speculation at large, as servants to an always already illegitimate reign of so-called capitalism, which literally means head, we should not forget. A disgust that concerns calculation and quantification in general to such a degree that seems maintainable only with regards to something one existentially and intimately has come to depend upon. Something one is subjected to by necessity but without trust, in a sharing of mutual respect and appreciation, without knowing, as the subject of such domination, what to expect, what to contribute, and how to speak up against, without knowing anymore how one matters. In short, abstraction has come to be perceived as an illegitimate demand, a harmful one and an exhausting one, one that needs to be resisted collectively and fought against. Waringer's key move with his text was to show how abstraction and empathy do not contradict one another in a dialectical sense, but rather afford one another in providing for a mutual polarity. Abstraction, as he shows, is actually capable of increasing empathy, and empathy actually provides grounds for abstraction that can in turn accommodate further empathy. Within climates that are always also intellectual in how they temper and characterize our domestic spaces. The thereby proposed domestic domain, if we can call it so, is hence also one of capital, in the sense of a stock of possibility and potentia. But it is a cornucopian one. Definite, rational, but inexhaustible. Such domestic economy is like those two other peculiar economies, those of knowledge and love. Giving some away does not diminish the amount one has. It tends to increase it. Thank you.